The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the guests and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the hosts and creators of this program. This is the Pet Buzz. This is the Pet Buzz. Freshly collected with news, celebrity pet gossip, and the latest pet trends. The Pet Buzz gives you the latest 411 on everything pet related. Everything pet related. Hosted by pet trendologist Charlotte Reed and Dr. Michael Fleck. And here's the Dynamic Pet Duo. You are listening to the Pet Buzz, the ultimate in pet talk radio. You know, during this time, people obviously are worried and they're panicked and they're fearful. But while I'm not going to downplay how you guys are feeling, I'm going to encourage you to keep busy. Don't you think that's the best thing to do, Dr. Fleck? It certainly does. Passes the time, doesn't make you think about the negatives that are out there. So turn the news on only a few hours a day, read a book, learn a language online, and also you can take some time and and play and have fun with your dog. Train your dog, you know, work on the training or teach your cat, you know, a trick. Pets are so helpful to relieve stress, and I'm sure you would agree, Dr. Fleck. They sure are. So take advantage of your pet ownership. So now let's kick off the show with our countdown. In segment four... Dr. Michelle Sonther is joining us from the University of Colorado at Boulder to talk about the Madagascar forest cat and their environmental impact on the island. Three. Does your cat have a secret life that you don't know about when he or she is out and about? Zoologist Roland Kays is joining us to talk about tracking cats and learn more about them when they are near or far away from home. And this is a worldwide project. In segment two, I'm talking about bad celebrity behavior in our celebrity news portion of the show. And Dr. Fleck is going to talk about hygienic essentials in Flex Facts. And one, today we're welcoming Shelly Rankin, a microbiologist at the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine, Philadelphia, to the Pet Buzz. She's here to talk about the risk of COVID-19 infection in pets. Her lab is part of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's Veterinary Laboratory Investigation and Response Network, a collective of veterinary diagnostics labs that could help determine the impact of the pandemic on pets and other animals. Dr. Rankin, thank you so much for joining us today and welcome to the Pet Buzz. Hi, Doc Mike and Charlotte. Thank you again for um, having me on the show today. I really appreciate the opportunity. Dr. Rankin, many pet owners have heard about this 19-year-old Pomeranian who tested positive for the new coronavirus after her owner came down with the virus. So what do we know about this? And the big questions are, can we pass the new coronavirus to our pets and can they pass the virus back to us? So uh, first things first, what we do know about the SARS-CoV virus is that it spreads from humans to humans. We also know that there has been no scientific research to support any human or animal spread at this time. There was that single report from Hong Kong, the Pomeranian dog had the virus. Um, I've heard many people say that this means that the dog got the virus from its owner who was sick, but we really just don't know that for sure. The report from Hong Kong, we know that the dog wasn't sick, so it's really pretty confusing for all of us right now, uh, for the owners and for the scientific community. We don't really have any good information. I've joked with some colleagues that it's a bit like a rumor that's going viral on social media. And so under those circumstances, I think we need to go with what the experts are saying until we know otherwise. That's a great answer, right? Because we really don't know, Dr. Flat. And so much we don't know about this new virus. So having that information you just presented, do you think that we should be testing the pets of people with confirmed cases of COVID-19? So I am going to take a very firm stand on that and say no, absolutely not at this time. And there's lots of reasons for it, but the biggest reason is that we need to keep all of the tests and all of the supplies that we need to run those tests available to test humans right now. Ah, Um, Veterinary diagnostic labs should not be stockpiling tests or supplies just in case we need them in the future. Um, If we do need them in the future, then we can get access to those supplies and the tests. But right now, I think we've all heard about the supply shortage of tests for humans, and that's where all the resources should go. Great. Great answer. And that's that's true. I mean, we have humans who are sick around the globe. It's a priority. And that's a priority. Okay. 
So if pet owners come down with the, the Nouvelle or the novel coronavirus, what should be done with their pets? So there's lots of discussion about that right now. Um, and I've seen some really interesting things pop up in the last few days. Uh, people infected with the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus really should limit contact with their pets. So what that means is it's really important to include pets in your family's preparedness planning. Make sure that not only that you have enough food and, and cat litter and medications to last, but make sure that you've done some research on potential boarding facilities. You know, find a trusty family member or a friend to care for your pets if something happens to you or someone in your household. But make sure you plan for this ahead of time. Like, don't be calling your friend at 7 p.m. on a Tuesday night. Make sure that you plan for this, especially if you live alone with a pet. Make sure that you know what's going to happen to them. So you probably think that this should go with a a family, certainly not into a a boarding kennel? I think it would be better all round if we prepared for, you know, like our beloved pets to be with a, a friend or a family member who's not sick. I don't actually know what will happen in terms of, you know, rules or restrictions for boarding kennels as this outbreak moves forward. There are many agencies right now, including the Humane Society, and I think also the American Veterinary Medical Association, who have uh, recommendations and plans that are generally available for disasters, so hurricane preparedness. And so most of those checklists are things that, you know, we can put into plans for pandemic preparedness. Very, very straightforward things. If you have people in the same house, some of whom which are quarantined and others that aren't quarantined, how should we handle our pets? And so, again, I think under those circumstances, so the people who are being quarantined are generally being quarantined because they have had an infection and they're recovering, um, or they've been in contact with somebody who has had an infection, and therefore they may be at high risk for acquiring that infection. Again, you know, working under the assumption that there's absolutely no evidence right now that this virus can pass from humans to animals, then you can continue to have your animal at home, minimizing contact with them. Don't let them lick your face. You know, have them sleep on the bed because they might be licking your face while you're asleep. You don't know. (laughs) The other thing is really just to um, plan, plan for this. You know, make sure that if you do get sick, if you're in quarantine and then you do get sick, that you have somebody who can take the animal from you. Great point. Well, if you've just joined us, we're talking with Dr. Shelley Rankin, a microbiologist at the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine. Her lab is one that could help determine the impact of pandemic on pets and other animals. Dr. Rankin, what should we be doing right now to protect our pets? Right now, I think if we want to protect our pets, the best thing we can do is protect ourselves. So, you know, minimize contact. Everything that we're seeing on the news, on social media about, um, you know, staying at home, uh, social distancing. If you do have to go to work, then make sure that, you know, you're not congregating in places with lots of different people. If we stay healthy, then there's absolutely no risk to our pets. So the risk to our pets right now is probably incredibly small, if it even exists. But if we're healthy, then there's no human to transfer the virus to an animal. So stay healthy. Stay healthy. Stay healthy. Take a (laughs) job. You know, know what? it's funny because all the gyms are closing, so it's a great idea. You can do download some videos and stay healthy. Well, they're helping you do that. Some of the gyms are helping you do that. You know, start taking your vitamins on a regular basis. Stay healthy. Well, absolutely. Dr. Rankin, thank you so much for helping to clear up some of the confusion we have of this new virus as it relates to pets. People are asking these questions every day. And we're so glad that you're here to answer them because I have to tell you, a lot of the doctors that we've seen on television, on national shows, are kind of bungling their responses. I don't think they're as prepared as they should be. So that's why we have you here. And so once again, thanks so much. Or as knowledgeable as you are. (laughs) Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. What great information. That was Dr. Shelley Rankin, a microbiologist at the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine, discussing the COVID-19 infection in pets and keeping our pets safe now. Up next, we're talking about Emily Ratajkowski and why she broke her self-imposed quarantine.
You are listening to The Pet Buzz with pet trendologist Charlotte Reed and veterinarian Dr. Michael Fleck. We love to communicate with you via social media. Use the Pet Buzz social media channels on Twitter and Facebook to make a comment or ask a question. Post a picture of your pet on Instagram and tell us about his or her unique personality. You can also write to us at team at thepetbuzz.com. For more information about our show, our guests, and our buzzworthy freebies, visit us at thepetbuzz.com. Hi, I'm Brad Garrett. The investigation of the Humane Society of the United States exposed the link between pet stores and puppy mills. Large puppy mill operations were busted in Maine, Oklahoma, Texas, and Virginia. Bottom line, puppy mills are cruel and their puppies are often sick. So do yourself a favor and go to your local shelter for your next dog. You'll get an inoculated, already fixed dog for almost nothing. So you'll not only save some money, but you'll also save a life. Does your pet have dry, flaky, and itchy skin? Do you find yourself visiting the veterinarian repeatedly because Fido or Fluffy has skin allergies or ear infections? I love animals and want my pets to be healthy. So I asked our vet who recommended EpiPet Ear Cleaner. It's super simple, and it even smells good. Every week I use it on both my dog and my cat to gently remove wax and debris. I even told my friend Aiden to try EpiPet on his dog Sophie, who always had red ears. But not anymore. Now we both have happy and healthy pets. Thanks, EpiPet. Developed by a veterinarian, EpiPet is a revolutionary, high-performance skin and ear care product line made with the finest natural ingredients. EpiPet, for you and your pet, means better pet health. For more information, visit epi-pet.com. Thank you so much for joining the Pet Buzz. This show is hosted by the Pet Dynamic Duo. I'm pet trendologist Charlotte Reed. And I'm veterinarian Dr. Michael Fleck. Let's kick off segment two with Celebrity Pet News. So do you all know Emily Ratajkowski? Well, if you don't know her, every guy I'm sure knows her. She's that beautiful brunette actress and model. She's always posing in these great, fantastic bathing suits. Well, anyway, it was reported by Yahoo News last week that Emily took a short break from her self-quarantine amid the corona pandemic to walk her dog. Now, really, the hype in the article was all about what she was wearing, including a crop top. But I was kind of trying to figure out why she was taking a break from self-quarantine to walk her dog because it looked like she was in New York City or L.A. with tons and tons of people. So I did a little research. So according to the Center for Disease Control, those who are self-quarantined are at a higher risk to get the virus and also to pass it. And as a result, they shouldn't be going out. They should avoid crowds. And this includes... Walking your dog, especially in a large, metropolitan, densely populated urban environment. Instead of lying around, taking selfies of herself, lying in the bed with her husband and her dog, it might be a great idea, Emily, to sleep in a bed by yourself so that your husband and dog can't be getting anything that could be passed. So, Em, this is a time to definitely think of others and, you know, Emily, this is a time to really think about others. Very key. So stay home, stay in a room until you are sure you no longer have Corona. Okay. So let's talk about some other news that's celebrity news that's floating out there. So right now there are a lot of deaths of celebrity dogs. We had Marnie a few weeks ago, the senior dog whose tongue stuck out. She was an older dog. She was seen over the years palling around with celebrities and serving as a spokes dog in numerous campaigns. And she was, of course, also the subject of a book. I would expect so. And then, of course, there's Beatrice, who famously played Stella on Modern Family. She sadly died about a week ago. The French bulldog who starred in the series for several seasons as Jay's beloved pooch. That's if you watch Modern Family, she passed away a few days ago after the series wrapped, and that's according to The Blast. And it's currently unclear what led to Beatrice's sudden death, 
But Estella, she was introduced in season two, and she was acquired by the Pritchett Delgado family when her previous owner decided to go back to school. So Beatrice was actually the second dog to play Stella after taking over the role in season four. So all we have to do is say rest in peace, Beatrice. And lastly, on the French bulldog front, Mario Lopez's canine family is growing. So French bulldog Julio Cesar Chavez Lopez has a new sibling. It's Oscar de la Hoya Lopez. And as the Lopez family knows, and as Dr. Fleck knows, we are all better with dogs. Right, Dr. Fleck? You bet. But I have to say, I like those names. Julio Cesar Chavez, right? Don't you like that? Very and interesting. Oscar de la Hoya Lopez. I like him. Okay. And now, of course, Flex Facts. Welcome to Just the Facts. Just the Facts. Fact or fiction? Just the Facts, ma'am. You want answers! I want the truth! This is going to take long. You got the time. So, Dr. Fleck, what are we going to talk about today? Dogs and other pet germs and how to protect ourselves. You know, germs from dogs and other pets can cause a variety of illnesses from minor skin infections to serious illnesses. One of the best ways you can protect yourself is to thoroughly wash your hands after handling, caring for, feeding, or cleaning up after your dogs and other pets. That's great advice. So tell us how the best way to wash our hands. Sure. Washing your hands is easy, and it's one of the most effective ways to prevent the spread of germs. Clean hands can stop germs from spreading from one person to another and throughout the entire community, from your home and workplace to child care facilities and even hospitals. So let's just talk about the guidelines. Wet your hands with clean running water, turn off the tap, and apply the soap. Okay, what's next? Lather your hands by rubbing them together with the soap. Lather the back of your hands between your fingers and under your nails. Under your nails is really important, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, what's next? Scrub your hands for at least 20 seconds. Need a timer? Hmm, I would hum the happy birthday song from beginning to end twice. Okay. And then what's next? Rinse your hands well under clean running water. Okay. And finally, dry your hands using a clean towel or even air dry them. Okay. So, Dr. Fleck, everyone's going crazy about hand sanitizer. Talk to us about hand sanitizer. Well, you can use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol if soap and water are not available. Okay. So washing hands with soap and water is the best way to get rid of germs in most situations, though. If soap and water are not readily available, you can use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer that, again, contains at least 60% alcohol. So how do you know that the hand sanitizer contains 60% alcohol? You can tell if the sanitizer contains at least 60% alcohol by looking at the product label. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, sanitizer can quickly reduce the number of germs on hands in many situations. However, sanitizers do not get rid of all types of germs. Hand sanitizers may not be as effective when hands are visibly dirty or greasy, and hand sanitizers might not remove harmful chemicals from the hands that pesticides and other heavy metals May leave. Okay. Are there dangers and what are the dangers of using hand sanitizer? Yeah, you know, sometimes worried about swallowing alcohol based hand sanitizers can cause alcohol poisoning if more than a couple of mouthfuls are swallowed. Okay. So keep it out of the reach of young children and pets. So can you tell us how to effectively use hand sanitizer? Because I think that's important. Absolutely. Just apply the gel product to the palm of one hand, then rub your hands together. Rub the gel over all the surfaces of your hands and fingers until your hands are dry. This should take about 20 seconds. Oh, just 20 seconds. Okay, that's pretty fast. And what else, Dr. Fleck? That's all the Flex Facts for the week. Thanks, Dr. Fleck. More of the Pet Buzz real soon. Bet you can't wait for my I Likey of the Week. You are listening to The Pet Buzz with pet trendologist Charlotte Reed and veterinarian Dr. Michael Fleck. We would love to communicate with you via social media. Use The Pet Buzz social media channels on Twitter and Facebook to make a comment or ask a question. 
Post a picture of your pet on Instagram and tell us about his or her unique personality. You can also write to us at team at thepetbuzz.com. For more information about our show, our guests, and buzzworthy freebies, visit us at thepetbuzz.com. How often should you bathe your pet? Well, I'm pet trendologist Charlotte Reed, and I'm asked that question often. How often you should wash your dog depends on a number of factors, including his health, breed, coat, and activity level, as well as where these activities are taking place. Dogs who spend days outside rolling in things are going to need a bath far more often than the ones who spend most of their time on the couch. Or you can always take the smell test. If your dog walks into the room and you can smell them, it's time for a bath. Make sure when it's time for a bath, you gather up all the supplies, including a non-slip mat and plenty of towels. Use shampoo formulated for dogs and turn your cell phone off to avoid distraction. And if you have a dog that hates getting a bath, smear some peanut butter on the bathtub wall and let him lick it off while you bathe him. Then he'll know bathing can really be a treat. Warmer temperatures mean more time outside. You have sunscreen for yourself, but what about Fido? According to the American Animal Hospital Association and the American College of Veterinary Dermatology, pets need sunscreen too. I love two things, sports and my dog Chester. Where I go, he goes. To the beach, to play soccer, everywhere. We spend a lot of time together in the sun, so I always carry a can of EpiPet sunscreen. So Chester is protected from the sun's harmful UV rays. I just spray it on and I don't have to worry. Chester is protected, so I know my sports buddies can be with me for a long time. Thanks, EpiPet. Use EpiPet Sun Protector, the only FDA-approved pet sunscreen on short-haired, light-colored, hairless, golden retrievers, and other dogs susceptible to skin cancer. Contained in a sports bottle, EpiPet allows you to turn the bottle upside down, making it easier to spray your dog all over to protect your dog from the sun all day and every day. Visit epi-pet.com. Hey, welcome back. You are listening to the Pet Buzz, the best in pet talk radio. I'm veterinarian Dr. Michael Fleck. And I'm pet trendologist Charlotte Reed. That's the way it has to be because that's the way I like it. It's genius. I like it. I love it so much. I like it. It's to die for. I like it. You know, it's so interesting that you talked in our last segment about washing your hands because Americans are more concerned than ever about bringing germs into their home. So my I likey of the week has to do with your product. That's the EpiPet Cleansing Agent Shampoo to wash your dog. EpiPet is a multifunctional shampoo that's formulated to use on dry, flaky, itchy, irritated, oily and smelly skin and fur coats. It's also beneficial to main healthy skin and hair coats for your dog. The cleansing agent, I should say your dog and your cat. Well, the cleansing agent shampoo is also antibacterial, antifungal, and anti-yeast. So that's a great aspect to the shampoo. There are 16 natural extracts that are performing a multitude of functions, including skin and hair coat conditioning, cleansing, moisturizing, enriching, and healing. And the other thing is it's got a really nice, pleasant lavender vanilla aroma, And it's just nice to have a clean pet walking around the house. You know, you can also, if you're taking your pet out for a walk now, you can also prepare a foot bath. So when he comes in or when you're at your front door, you can just wipe his feet off. So the other thing is the natural essential oils in the shampoo serve as a deterrent to fleas because it is spring and spring is right just around the corner, quote unquote, officially. So receive a 20% discount when purchasing the shampoo by utilizing the code, the pet buzz so now let's uh let's bring on our next guest who's talking cats dr fleck sounds good to me okay so question for all of you if you have a cat does your cat have a secret life wouldn't you want to know where he or what she is up to when they're outside left (laughs) up to their own devices so joining us today to talk about what cats do when outside is roland k's a research associate professor at North Carolina State University and head of the Biodiversity Lab at NC Museum of Natural Sciences. Dr. Kays is a zoologist with a broad interest in ecology and conservation, especially of mammals. He is an expert in using new technologies 
to study free-ranging animals, especially to track their movement with telemetry, GPS, and remote camera traps. Dr. Kays, thank you so much for joining us on the Pet Bus today. Well, thanks for having me on. So, do cats have secret lives that their owners don't know anything about? Well, for sure they do, although what we found from tracking them is they're not as wild and crazy as, as some people think because most cats are not moving around very much. They're not going that far from the owner's house as we found. On average, from hundreds of cats we tracked in six different countries, that most of them are staying in about 100 meters or 100 yards of their house. Well, you know, I'm just curious. Let's take a step back. So what <laughs> prompted you to, to cat track? I mean, how did this study come about? Well, it was kind of two things. One was this question, you know, every pet owner has is, where does my cat go? And then the other thing that, that's interesting is we had seen some studies estimating um, how many uh, native species, birds and small mammals and lizards, that cats kill every year. And it was astonishingly high. But at the end, we were kind of like, well, so what? There's, you know, there's lots of birds out there. But we wondered, where does that actually take place? Is it out in the nature preserves or is it mostly in people's backyards? Interesting. And that's really a hot topic, or should I say a hot bed of controversy, <laughs> what cats are up to and how many local species are they killing? So talk to us about what organizations were or are involved in this study. Yeah, well, so initially it started as a project here in North Carolina. I was working with some colleagues at North Carolina State University and a bunch of students, and we thought, well, this would be fun. There's these new GPS trackers that are pretty cheap. We can buy a bunch, and we can round up some local uh, uh, cat owners, and let's see what happens. Let's see where they go. So we started doing that, um, and we started putting our results online um, to share, you know, the cat track with uh, the owners and with other people. And um, what was interesting was how quickly this grew into a global project. Wow. How interesting. Really? Really? So if you've just joined us, we're talking with Professor or Dr. Roland Kays about the Cat Tracking Project. He's an expert in using new technologies to study free-ranging animals, especially to track their movement with GPS and remote camera traps. Dr. Kays, can you kind of discuss the various parts of the study and the protocol of the study? Sure. Well, the core of it was the animal tracking, because basically we figured out um, to answer this question of what's the ecological impact of cats, we needed two bits of information. One was how many animals these cats are killing, and the other one is how much area are they doing this hunting over. And so we got both this information from working with citizen scientists, you know, the, the cat owners, and they would report how many animals their um, cats were bringing home, which we know isn't a perfect record, it's an underestimate of how many they kill. So we had some some adjustment factors. And this is the kind of information that's been collected by lots of other studies before, and our results were pretty similar to that. Kind of on average, we had a lot of cats hunting around four, four or five animals per month, and then some more active hunters hunting sort of 10, 11, 12 animals per month. But the new part really was to add the spatial component. How much of an area are they using? And that allowed us to make some extrapolations about how many prey per hectare, per area, they're killing. And that allowed us to compare the pet cats to uh, wild native cats. Ah. So what did the study reveal? Well, we found that, I mean, not surprisingly, the, the pet cats are hunting less than wild cats, right? They've got food to eat, so they don't need to hunt for a living. So the jungle cat is obviously hunting a lot more, but they're using a much, much larger area. So when you figure out how many prey their cat is killing per unit area, the pet cats end up being somewhere around having two to five times more ecological impact than wild cats uh, per cat. And then when you add to the fact that some places, pet cats live at much higher densities than wild cats, it gets more to sort of the five to ten times more ecological impact. The other thing that I was also curious about the study was there were different components. Like one was about cat diet. I mean, other than the wildlife. And then um, wasn't there something else like cat droppings or something like that? We thought about that, the cat droppings. And we thought about, well, maybe we'll have um, someone, a citizen, send us cat species to look for uh, wild prey. We decided, <laughs> we decided not to do that. Um, 
I really decided I didn't want my lab full of uh, cat turds from all around the planet. <laughs> the one, you know, interesting, we had another study that we just published recently as well um, from the same project where we worked with isotopes to look at cat diet. Um, and the idea here was uh, sort of you are what you eat. So if you get a sample of cat fur, so just brush your cat and people would send us in their fur, we look at the carbon and nitrogen isotopes to try to see if we could tell whether the cat was only eating the cat food or was also eating other stuff. And what was interesting was <laughs> the study didn't work very well. Um, and the reason it didn't work very well was we found that the isotopic values of the cat's food was really variable. We thought that would all be really consistent. And we could see, you know, if, if a cat look has the same values as its cat food, then it's a match. And if it doesn't, then they're eating some wild prey. But we found instead this food different flavors and even the same flavor of the same brand could have quite a lot of variability in its chemical composition. Um, so it made it really hard to disentangle the wild food from the uh, pet food. Interesting. Well, I assume you want to continue the study. So we have some listening audience. How can they participate? Well, at the moment, what we're doing is what, what we want to do next is um, we're kind of calling it Cat Tracker 2.0 is some better technology that will get a much higher resolution track of what the cat's doing and then also get a measurement of its behavior. So these tags that we're testing out right now have three axis accelerometers built in that collect um, kind of like a Fitbit, and they collect basically really high-resolution data. Well, Dr. Case, it's really very interesting, and thank you for sharing it with us today on the Pet Bus. Well, thanks for having me on and uh, giving me a chance to share this story with your listeners. Yeah, you'll have to keep us updated on what's happening with Cat Tracking 2.0. I think we'd be very fascinated. <laughs> well, everyone, that was research lead Dr. Roland Kays discussing the Cat Tracking study. To learn more about this unique study, visit cattracker.org. Okay, stay tuned. We'll be back in a flash. So I'm a cat. And I just moved in with this new human. And she's got this little toy she's always playing with all day long. Tap, 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 bloop, bloop. She can't put it down. There it is. Oh, and get this. She even talks to it. Last week, she asked it for Chinese. And guess what? Egg rolls showed up like magic. Humans have cool toys. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the ShelterPetProject.org. When your doctor recommended omega fatty acids as a daily supplement, he told you that they promoted better heart, brain, skin, joint, and immune system health. Well, doesn't it make sense for your pet to have the same health benefits? EpiPet Whole Fish Treat, an all-natural smoked fish supplement, is 100% bioavailable, bringing your pets the nutrients they need to keep them healthy and happy. To order better pet health for your dog or cat, visit www.epi-pet.com. I'm petrologist Charlotte Reed. And I'm veterinarian Dr. Michael Fleck. We are urban, suburban, and, and country. And now, pet buzz news from around the globe. For global pet news, it's really interesting because everyone's talking about this 19-year-old Pomeranian in Hong Kong. Well, the dog identified by the South China Morning Post as this 19-year-old Pomeranian died on Monday, this past Monday. The Hong Kong Agricultural Fisheries and Conservation Department said in an email citing the animal's owner. The department said the cause of death could not be determined after the owner, who recently recovered from coronavirus infection, declined to conduct an autopsy on the dog. The World Health Organization for Animal Health has cautioned that there is no evidence of pets transmitting the virus to humans. However, because animal and people can sometimes share diseases, it's still recommended that people who are sick with COVID-19 limit contact with their companion and other animals until more information is known about the virus. Okay, really, really key. So let's bring on our next guest. In a study published in Conservation Genetics, Professor Michelle Saunther and her colleagues have drawn on genetic data from dozens of wild cats from Madagascar to help them understand the local ecology. And joining us today 
is University of Colorado at Boulder's professor, Michelle Sother. Professor Sother's major focus of research is to better understand how both immediate and long-term environmental factors interact with inter-individual variation to affect primate behavior and biology. In essence, she is very interested in how primates negotiate living within a variety of environments. Professor Souther, welcome to the Pet Buzz. Thank you, Dr. Fleck. So, Professor, okay. please describe for us the Madagascar forest cat. So the, the forest cat is a cat that it lives in primary forest. Um, it's about twice as large as uh, a domestic cat or what you would think of as a domestic cat in, in the villages. And they always are the same color. They're what we call a mackerel tabby. So if you think about a tabby with kind of black and sort of dark brown. Cool. So how do these cats serve as an example of what you call the cat diaspora? I thought that was kind of an interesting comment that um, I saw in your article. Yeah. Well, you think about the term diaspora, that's actually from a, it's a classical Greek word. And all it really means is scattering or a dispersion. In, uh, in Madagascar, there are no uh, cats. There have never been regular cats. There are all kinds of other really cool, interesting animals like lemurs and a carnivore called a fusa, but there are no cats. So when we talk about a diaspora, we think about, you know, cats coming from Egypt and then going across the world. So now we know they're in places that they probably shouldn't be, but they somehow got there, and we think that's what's happened in terms of these forests. Wow, that's really interesting. Wow, really crazy. So what prompted you to study the Madagascar forest cat? There's a, a wide variety of wildlife researchers in Madagascar. I've been studying there for about 30 years. And I started to notice, like a lot of my colleagues, that when you were out in the forest and you were following the lemurs around, that you kept running into this strange cat. They always looked the same, and they didn't look anything like the village cats. Because the village cats are like what you would expect. You know, they're sometimes a tabby color or white, and they're really pretty small. These guys were robust. They're large. One of my colleagues had one on a table where they were trying to collect blood, and he told me that instead of hissing, this thing roared at him. <laughs> you know, before we go any further, I think it's a great idea, Dr. Sother. Tell us where Madagascar is. I mean, Dr. Fleck and I know, but maybe some people in our listening audience don't know. And and also, you know, they need to know that it's an island. It's Yeah, good idea. Yeah. Yeah, Madagascar um, is off the east coast of Africa. So if you think about kind of where Kenya is and move, you know, east and you run into this island, it's about the size of California. So it's a big island. It has lots and lots of people. It's actually one of the poorest countries in the world. They, their annual average income is $260. Ooh. So it's, a, it's an interesting place because you've got all these really poor people that are struggling, but then you've got all these amazing animals like lemurs, animals that you don't find anywhere else in the entire world. This is the only place you can see a lemur. If you want to see it in the wild, you have to go to Madagascar. Wow. And just think about island life. I mean, these people live on an island. Mm -hmm. But it's so, a big one. But it's a big one. I mean, the size, I never knew Madagascar was the size of California. Well, if you've just joined us, we're talking to Dr. Michelle Sother about Madagascar forest cats. So let's talk about how these cats are a threat to the country's native species. Sure. One of the things that we know is that um, some of the researchers have been using these camera traps. So look, if you go hunting or whatever, you probably know what a camera trap is, but you can set it up remotely and it'll capture animals coming by. People started to realize that these forest cats are showing up on these camera traps and um, people started to realize that whenever you see lots and lots of pictures of the forest cat, you see less and less of lemurs and the animals that should be there. So people started to get concerned that this was potentially a threat. And then some of my research has shown that, um, that um, the cats actually are taking lemurs. They're taking a, uh, endemic birds. They're, they're eating insects. They're kind of eating anything they can get their hands on. <laughs> but, but essentially, we're worried about the lemurs because to keep doing this, that could be a real problem in terms of uh, lemur conservation. Well, what I understand, they're also um, like going after mongoose, correct? I think they go after anything they can get their hands on, okay. essentially. Um, they're really good at um, 
being kind of a generalist. And that's why, for example, cats, when they get to Hawaii or, you know, places, other island habitats, they do really well because the animals aren't adapted to a predator like that. Wow, that's that's really interesting, knowing that the mongoose goes after snakes too, don't they? Yes, exactly. So yeah, they're not they're not an easy wow. <laughs> they're not easy to deal with. So yeah, I, I should say that the endemic um, carnivore that's supposed to be there, which is called a fusa, and it kind of looks like a mongoose on steroids. It is very good at actually eating the cats. So I think we have this kind of fight uh-huh. between. The forest cats trying to take over, and the is saying, no, I think I will eat you and, and make you go away. Food chain, very interesting. So why do we need to study their DNA to create a conservation policy? Because these cats have basically been these mystery cats. We all know they live in the forest. They all look the same. They don't look like regular cats, but nobody knows what they are. And Back 30 years ago when I started doing research, a lot of us were thinking maybe they were African wildcats that somehow, you know, hitched a ride from Africa and got to Madagascar because they actually do look a lot like African wildcats. So the the big question has been all these years is to find out what they are. So we ended up being able to um, collaborate a broad number of uh, researchers and be able to use the data that's out there on domestic cats to show that, in fact, these guys are domestic cats, but they probably have gotten to Madagascar a relatively long time ago. Yeah, it was suggested, I mean, I guess they came from um, the Arab states hundreds of years ago on ships who probably used them for mousing. Yes, exactly. And um, in Madagascar, um, we have some... uh, uh, Arabic uh, architecture that dates back probably 800, 900, almost 1,000 years. Well, Dr. Souther, what interesting research you, you do, and it's so different from what we're used to here in the States for research that's being done. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Dr. Fleck, and thank you, Charlotte Reed. I really appreciate this. Well, everyone, that was Dr. Michelle Thonther of the University of Colorado at Boulder discussing the Madagascar forest cats and how they impact the environment on the island. Wait, did you hear that bell? That's the signal. It's time to wrap the show. But before we go, we want to give you a preview of next week's show. So next week, we're talking with Dr. Peter Lee, the Chinese policy expert from the Humane Society International. We're going to talk about how to keep your pet entertained as you both are spending more time at home. And also, representatives from Preserve Pets will be with us discussing how to preserve your beloved pet after its passing. Now, Dr. Fleck, can you please thank our guest? Yeah, a special thanks to our guests, Dr. Shelley Rankin, Dr. Roland Kays, and Dr. Michelle Souther. Great. And, of course, we must always thank our sponsors, the Animal Medical Center of Bradenton and EpiPet, making better skin, coat, and ear care products for healthier pets everywhere. And if you have a question, write us at team at the We'll cover it next week on our show. Yeah, and don't forget, sign up for our newsletter at newsletter at team at the so you can catch up with Dr. Fleck and myself. And if you miss any portion of this show, visit our social media channels as well as your favorite streaming channels and listen to the linked podcast on Monday morning. And most importantly, remember, we're here each week to help you take better care of your pets. Peace out and pet love. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Pet Buzz. The Pet Buzz is hosted by the dynamic pet duo, pet trendologist Charlotte Reed and Dr. Michael Fleck. Tune in each week for the latest 411 on everything pet related. Visit our website at www.thepetbuzz.com. Learn more about us, the show, and our guests.